take a look at Pascal's triangle. Pascal's triangle is a triangular array of numbers such that each term is equal to the sum of the um, previous two terms. So for example, 15 is 5 plus 10, or 21 is 15 plus 6. Now, let's take any row of this Pascal's triangle, say the 10th row, and we paint with blue the multiples of 2, and we paint with pink the multiples of 5. Well, you can see that omitting the trivial ones in the edge, we have colored all numbers in the row with either blue, pink, or both numbers. Now, what if we try with five and with other two primes, five and seven, it also works. And what if we go to another row of this triangle, say the 14th row? Well, with two and seven, again, we paint all the numbers in this row. So you may be wondering, does this always happen? So no matter which row do we take in this triangle, we can always find two primes, such that if we paint the multiples of one prime with one color and the multiples of the other prime with another color, all the numbers in the row are painted. Well, until 16, it works. But it turns out that Pascal's triangle is a visual representation of binomial coefficients. And when we say the nth row of Pascal's triangle, we're actually referring to the binomial coefficients from n choose 1 until n choose n minus 1. Therefore, the problem that we are visualizing with Pascal's triangle can be rephrased in the following way. So, condition 1. For a positive integer n, there exists primes p and r, such as all the binomial coefficients from n choose 1 until n choose n minus 1 are divisible by at least 1 of p or r. This means that if n satisfies condition 1, the nth row of Pascal's triangle is painted with two primes. Now, the question is, does condition 1 hold for all integers n? So are all the rows of Pascal triangle painted? Well, this is an open problem in number theory, and, we, and what we have been doing these past weeks was try to prove as many cases as we could in which n satisfies this condition. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk about one of the first proofs that we encountered because the idea behind it are useful for many other proofs in the paper. Now, consider a particular case in which n satisfies condition one. Remember that in the 10th row of Pascal's triangle, we used the primes two and five, and they worked. And 10 is two times five. Also, 14 is two times seven, and two and seven worked. This also happens when n is a product of two prime powers. For example, 72 is two to the three times three to the two, and two and three work. Well, what does your intuition tell you? You may be wondering that, is it always true that if n is a product of two prime powers, then n satisfies condition one with these two primes? It looks that it's correct. And I can tell you the answer is yes. But before we get to the proof, we need some background information. So we're looking at the remainder for when we divide a binomial coefficient by a prime p. Say we want to know which is the remainder when we divide 21 choose 12 by 2. Well, just a little notation thing. When we say that 15 is congruent to 0 modulo 5, it means that when we divide 15 by 5, the remainder is 0, and therefore 15 is a multiple of 5. Now, binomial coefficients, apart from appearing in Pascal's triangle, uh, they can also be defined using the factorial function. So if I told you, could you please tell me the remainder when we divide 21 choose 12 by 2? Well, you would have to compute 21 factorial, which is a pretty huge number. Then 12 factorial, 9 factorial, multiply, divide, and that number divided by 2 and check the remainder. This is quite a long computation, but luckily we have Lucas theorem, which is an amazing and magical shortcut, which basically gives us a remainder when we divide a binomial coefficient by a prime p without actually having to compute this binomial. Now, it only requires three easy steps. So first of all, we have n, k, and p, which in this example are 21, 12, and 2. We represent n and k in base, in base p. And converting a number in base p basically means that we express this number as the sum of consecutive powers of that prime, as you can see here in the example. Now, we place the base p digits of n above the base p digits of k. We split the digits, we convert them into little binomial coefficients, as you can see here, then we compute these little binomial coefficients, we multiply the results, and what we get is a remainder. So in this case, 21 choose 12 is congruent to 0 modulo 2, which means that 21 choose 12 is divisible by 2. So note that for our problem, we want this number to be 0, because if the remainder is 0, then n choose k is divisible by the prime p, which is what we want, because if it's divisible by p, then it is painted by p, and we want n to satisfy condition 1. Now, if any of these little binomial coefficients is zero, then everything gets multiplied by zero, and we get the remainder that we want. So the question is, when does it happen? Well, for any positive values of a and b, the binomial coefficient a choose b is zero, even only if b is strictly larger than a. Now, this means that if the digit below is larger than the digit above, we get the remainder zero. So this gives us an important corollary in Lucas' theorem, which is that if any of the digits below, which is the base p of k, is larger than the digit just above, then the binomial coefficient n choose k is divisible by p. So now let's go back to the proof. Recall that we wanted to see that if n is equal to p1 to the alpha times p2 to the beta, when p1 and p2 are primes, then 
uh, and satisfies condition one with P1 and P2. So the first thing that's important to see is that the base P1 representation of N finishes with alpha zeros, because alpha is exponent. In the same way, the base, um, the base P2 representation of N finishes with beta zeros, because also it's exponent. So for example, 72 is 2 to the 3 times 3 to the 2, and then the base 2 representation of 72 ends with three zeros, because it can be divided three times by two until we run out of factors. So now here we have the base P1 representation of N and the base P2 representation of N. And we look at the last alpha digits and the last beta digits. So now, for <coughs> consider the base P1 representation of K. If any of the last alpha digits of the base P1 representation of K is not zero, then we get the digit below is larger than the digit above, and therefore the binomial coefficient N choose K is divisible by P1. The same thing happens with P2 and beta. And this is what we want, because then N would satisfy condition one. So we would have a problem if we could find a K between one and n minus one that would finish also with alpha zeros in base P1 and beta zeros in base P2. But can this happen? Well, the, the thing is that the minimum number that's multiple of both prime powers is n. And if k finished with alpha zeros and beta zeros, then k would also be a multiple of both p1 to the alpha and p2 to the beta. But by definition, k is at most n minus one. Therefore, no such k exists and the proof is complete. Now, with this proof, we will also go into other cases in which n satisfies condition one, and I will just mention one that considers the closest prime to n. And I will just give the highlights of the proof. So here's another case. Let qi be the closest prime to n, and let pqiq be any prime power factor of n. We claim that if the difference between n and the closest prime to n is as more than some prime power factor of n, then n satisfies condition one. Basically, what we used was Bertrand's theorem, which says that there's always a prime between n halves and n. And with this, when with this theorem, we know that n minus qi is as more than n halves. Therefore, k can only be in this interval or in this interval. So if k is in the first interval, we can prove using this inequality that um, all the minimal coefficients n choose k are divisible by pq. On the other hand, if k lies in the other interval, then using the trick of the digit below, we can prove that all the minimal coefficients n choose k are divisible by qi. So you might be wondering, does this always happen? So is it true that for all integers n, they satisfy this inequality here? Well, unfortunately not, because otherwise the conjecture would be proven. But um, until one million, there are only nearly 500 exceptions. And actually, we computed the sequence of numbers that do not satisfy this inequality. And if, if you are interested, you can check the online encyclopedia of integer sequences, because they published um, our sequence. Now, with these tools and, and ideas, we could prove many cases in which n satisfies condition one. I just wanted to highlight three of them that use QI and PQ. Uh, other things that we did was we used prime gas conjecture to prove that if n is sufficiently large and we keep fixed the number of prime factors of n, then n satisfies condition one. Also, we wondered what if instead of painting with two colors, we paint with three colors? How many cases can we prove? And then if we paint with m colors and we found upper bounds on the minimum number of m such that all integers n would satisfy this variation of condition one. And we have four different upper bounds. Also, another question that we considered was, given n, how many primes make n satisfy condition one? Because recall that, in, for example, in the 10th row of Pascal and Triangle, two and five painted all the numbers, but so did five and seven. Now, in this plot, you can see until 3,000, for each integer n, how many pairs of primes make n satisfy condition one. And I leave as a little problem to the audience to think about why the line with the greatest slope corresponds to the numbers that are prime powers. And you can explain this using the tools and ideas that I talked about in this presentation. So finally, <laughs> no, no, okay, it's just if someone has time and wants to think about this. Uh, well, um, so finally, another thing that makes this problem so interesting is that uh, Sharation and Woodrow proved in a recent paper that and condition one can be translated into group theory, which means that if this problem is solved, then many problems in group theory are also solved. So um, luckily, with these tools and ideas, you start thinking about this problem, maybe prove the remaining cases, and therefore solve this elegant and thrilling open problem. So I would like to acknowledge my mentor, Oscar Michaling, my tutor, Dr. Rickert, um, all the people from the MIT math department, also those who read my paper, CE, RSI, MIT for this opportunity, and also to all of you for your attention and for making this summer the best experience of my life. Thank you.
confirm what I think I heard you say. So it's not that it, we don't know that like three primes would be enough or four primes would be enough. There's no version of the conjecture that's proven that says like, yeah, if we just had you know, yeah, so primes, we'd be fine. Yeah, so the question was, um, what if we consider more than two primes? When is the question fine? So basically, during the first two weeks, we we're trying to prove as many cases as we could using two primes. But since uh, we didn't cover all the cases, then we asked, how many do we need? And then the four upper bounds that we found depend on n. So basically, depending on the conditions of n and other inequalities, you can find four upper bounds. And therefore, in some cases, two will be enough, or three will be enough, or some will be enough, because uh, they are a function of, of n these upper bounds. But th they exist, and therefore, like, so with a finite number of, of primes, you can paint for any integer. But it might grow with that. It, it might grow with that, yes. Yes, yes. Any other questions from the judges? Um, so, so, like, is there some sense, I mean, it sounds like there are a number of cases that are? Um, Sorry? There sounds like there are a number of cases you haven't solved. Is there some sense of what the hardest Cases look like, or what <laughs> so the question is, uh, which cases did we not solve? So basically, with that inequality before, um, there are a number of sections. And then what we thought is, what if instead of taking the closest prime to n, we take the closest prime to n halves? And then there was another inequality that we could use. And then until 1 million, there were like 80 exceptions. And then what if we take the closest prime to n thirds? But the problem is that the, 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 um, the smallest um, you go, so n over d, the, the greatest d is, then you create more dangerous intervals. Uh, because for example, when we go to the closest prime uh, to n halves, we have like three intervals. Only in two, we can assure that all the binomial coefficients are divisible by one of the two primes. But we have a problem on the third one. And for example, in this case, um, we could prove that if n is odd, then the, the condition is true in that case. But if n is even, we can only prove some cases. So. So this is how we found actually the upper bounds by finding how many dangerous intervals do we have, and then we put one extra prime for each interval. So following up on my question, um, have you done enough uh, or looked at enough n to, to have a sense of the density or how the rate of growth and how many times you might need to grow the prime density or anything like that or the logarithm? Mm -hmm. So the question was, um, have you thought about density? Actually, we didn't consider um, density as, as, as a term. But because what we were trying to do is have a collection of cases in which that is satisfied. For in the case of the original version of condition one, which is with two primes, we actually have many cases, and they are not all relate, so they are not in the same direction. For example, we have some cases in which if 2n satisfies condition 1, then n satisfies condition 1. So since all the cases are not related, it's, it, it's difficult to exactly count how many, how many numbers do we cover. But uh, in a sense, yeah, we, we did compute um, the number of integers that did not satisfy these inequalities, and they kept decreasing as the days went on. But yeah, that would be a, that would be a, a great thing to, to look at. Also, yeah, you, also the thing about prime gas conjectures, also when n tends large, this, this, so because these uh, theorems and primes, they also always uh, use density, it could be really nice to look at that. Yeah, other questions from the judges? All right, um, any questions from the audience members? All right, thank you. Even. Uh,